Well, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for gifting us a full hall in what could be the last session of the day. Uh, unless you're working midnight oil, uh, this is uh, perhaps the most important subject uh, today, uh, infrastructure, because the big challenge in India is infrastructure and the big opportunity in India is inf infrastructure. Because if you look, want to look at India's economy, you don't have to look at anything else, but look at all the unbuilt roads, unbuilt railways, unbuilt ports, unbuilt hospitals, unbuilt uh, medical colleges, unbuilt engineering colleges. Uh, a lot of India will be built in the years to come. Uh, so I have a stellar panel. Uh, I should not speak more and take away their time. Fred Hochberg, my very old acquaintance, uh, uh, U.S. Export-Import Bank. Uh, we were pulling his leg the other day that how come uh, Airbus is beating Boeing uh, in India so roundly. Uh, Mr. Nitin Not Gadkari. that roundly. <laughs> <laughs> Not that roundly. <laughs> uh, Nitin Gadkari, all of you know, he's the friendliest uh, minister. Uh, and he's a bit like, you know, uh, it's a wrong uh, mention, but anyway, cricket's cricket. There was a Pakistani cricket call, cricketer called Inzamamul Haq. So it was said that he plays the ball with the most time. So he plays the ball with the most time. <laughs> he always has, he's always relaxed, so he's never rushed into anything. Uh, that's the man for crisis. Uh, Nick Chisholm, I, I, that little uh, whisper that I exchanged with him was to figure out how to correctly pronounce his name. I think I got it right, of KPMG. They are the ones who tell you uh, how to uh, do everything their way and then tell you also uh, how this was wrong and get paid both ways. Uh, <laughs> Sunil Kanodia is a money man. Uh, he is also remarkable in that he runs his business out of Kol Kolkata and the business is profitable and he's liquid. Uh, <laughs> so liquid he can give money to others. And uh, Rana Kapoor, Rana Kapoor founded uh, India's most successful uh, young and the most forward-looking and fastest-growing private bank, Yes Bank, uh, although I do know that sometimes they say no to borrowers uh, who they don't trust. But that's I why asked they have once a good and he said, we just say we can't say yes. <laughs> <laughs> we can't say yes. So uh, I think to get us all started, uh, let's start with uh, Nitin Gadkari, uh, because he's made a big difference ever since he's come in. And if you take a poll anywhere, I think even Congress people, I know Gaurav Gogo is sitting here, uh, they will tell you that one area that's moving, uh, Gaurav Gogoi is a member of parliament from Assam in Congress. Uh, they will tell you that one area that has really started to move is highways. Uh, Nitin is in charge of highways, ports. Now his new dream project, which is the Indian River Waterways project, on which I am sure there will be questions. So Nitin, go ahead. Sir, uh, we have the national highway length of 96,000 kilometers. Total uh, length of roads in India is 52 lakh kilometers, out of which national highway was only 96,000 kilometers. Every year, 5 lakhs accidents and 1 lakh 50,000 deaths. So we have taken a decision to convert uh, the national highway from 96,000 kilometers to 2 lakh kilometers. Already, we have reached up to 1 lakh 75,000 kilometers. And after converting national highway into 2 lakh kilometer, 80 percent of traffic of India will, will be on national highway. There is a huge potential is available. We have already decided to make a four-lane road when the traffic is more than 10,000 PCUs. So we have a lot of projects now, economically viable, where we are converting four lanes. And the most important thing is for this year, the, we have decided to start the major express highways. The first express highway, access control express highway of the country is uh, Delhi Easterly and Westerly Bypass. It was awarded already, Prime Minister giving us the target of complete within 400 days. Now 100 days already over, but I am confident that this road is which is going to reduce the 50% pollution and 50% traffic jam uh, uh, of Delhi will be completed within 400 days, we will inaugurate that. And that will be a success story, the Axis Control Highway of Delhi. The second is from Delhi to Jaipur and Delhi to Katra up to Srinagar. And the most important today, probably within three months, we will start the express highway from Baduda to Mumbai. The first package we will go for the tender. So the in the highways now, 
national highway we don't have any problem we are in hybrid mode also and uh, road construction at the time when our government was at that time it was something 2 to 3 km per day it is now 22 km per day our target is 42 km per day for end of march but today the highway projects are moving fast and we have a new innovative model name as hybrid nut where land acquisition forest environment clearance utility shifting will be the response of the government and at the same time we are already uh, we giving 40% as a grant in aid to the project and 60% is from investor out of 60% 30% is his capital and other loan will be given by the bank and uh, already we have uh, sanctioned the projects more than 1 lakh crores in this nut mode and the toll will be collected by nhi and uh, interest cost plus 3% profit we will return him back on nut basis Uh, this is a very success story now because of in indian situation previously the investors position was not that much good they are not in position to invest in it so we formulate a new policy of hybrid nut and where we have, have already we have a good response for that the second thing is uh, our most important and priority sector is now inland waterways and for this year today uh, we have already started work in ganga we are making three multimodal hub one is at varanasi haldia and saibganj we are making 40 water ports five rural services and uh, one we are changing the water gate in farakka and maintaining the drop top 3 meter from varanasi to haldia 1680 kilometers already the works more than cost uh, for 4000 crore we have already sanction and majority work is already work order is given we have started now the rural services at the same time in in brahmaputra five places our plan is to start rural services we are making passenger terminals in our major ports to increasing cruise tourism and uh, we are also uh, now very much positive and supporting for new investment in this uh, waterways and sagarmala our all ports are in profits the previous year our profit was more than 6000 crore all ports all organization are in profit we are investing that money in waterways and for this year we are going to start the work of 36 waterways we are already the dpr is ready we will go for the tender process so i feel that the waterways can be a game changer because the logistic cost is very important and by waterways we can reduce the logistic cost which will really very helpful for the industry so these are the important but if you want to ask anything to me i will try to give the answer of all this well, before others who i'll ask you a question because uh, <laughs> your your waterways project is now under sort of environmental questioning and attack uh, not just from activists but also the chief minister of bihar has said that you will convert ganga into a series of ponds actually unfortunately the misimpression the mind of some people probably technical point of view from varanasi to haldia we don't need any barrages in ganga probably either one place it may be there but technically as per the expert of world bank they say probably we don't need and already farakka there is a barrage is there so we will maintain the 3 meter of draft so there will no problem for we are not going to convert it it's a misimpression in the mind of the chief minister he suggest me that even uh, the farakka barrage you should destroy and i can't understand what is the logic behind it but we will convince him and give him the information about it so uh Nick Chisholm, if I may ask you, you think some of the things that India is doing and some of the things that Mr. Gadkari is doing uh, are these good enough to convince investors globally who who are careful about who oh, should yes. be careful about their money? Oh yes. Um, so you started by saying this is the most into- important topic we will be talking about today, um, and to put some context around that for me. Um, the defining narrative of our lifetimes is many more people worldwide 
living on average longer, better lives. And all the challenges that we're discussing at fora like this, whether they be sustainability and development, urbanization, global interconnectedness, and public trust, and all the issues that hang off that, infrastructure underpins all those challenges. Um, and if we envision a world we want to live in with sustainable, affordable mobility, water, power, housing, healthcare, education for everybody, then the decisions that we are taking today, that the minister is taking and will be taking over the next five years are absolutely critical to how the future of our lifetimes and our children's plays out. The center of gravity in the infrastructure world has undoubtedly and inevitably shifted eastwards in the last couple of decades, initially towards China and now towards India. Um, and any global company has to have a strategy on India. Otherwise, it can't call itself a global company. So is there something more that you would like India to do to make those investors comfortable? Well, in terms of India's place in the world in the global infrastructure market where countries are essentially competing for investment money, India is a magnet at the moment because it has a great story to tell uh, and there is the political will there to get things done. The great story, of course, is around demographics, around innovation, and technology and around progress. I flew here from Chennai uh, last night and um, that is a far more pleasurable experience these days um, than it would be, Fred, forgive me, flying from, say, Chicago to New York um, midweek. And that just I, I, pains you, I know. Um, so that reflects the progress um, that is being made. And, and people want to invest um, in infrastructure, but India is at a bit of a crossroads. Um, progress has been made, there are great opportunities there, but of course there are um, challenges too, which I can expand on now or later, depending on your preference. So since we are on the subject of <coughs> global investors and global money, I think, uh, Fred, uh, right time for you to come in. <laughs> when do you bring the, bring the big mega billions into India? Well, uh, thank you for that very generous introduction. The Export Import Bank of the United States uh, is our trade bank. Uh, what we can finance and have financed is uh, exports of U.S. goods and services. So uh, whether it's um, aircraft for commercial airlines, whether it's uh, power generation, uh, petrochemical plants, uh, rail, uh, those are the types of projects that we can mm -hmm. finance. Uh, but our role is really in providing debt for those not equity, and it has to be attached to U.S. exports. So uh, India has been a very strong market um, for a long time, was second only to Mexico. Um, there's a bit, we've had a little less activity in the last year or two, uh, but partly that's because I think there is more localization. You might be building the wall next year, financing the wall next year. <laughs> <laughs> Depends if it's an export. <laughs> uh, Mexico will borrow money from you to build a wall. <laughs> I'll leave that alone. Uh, so I think that we <coughs> we can see. Uh, you're making me choke with a comment like that. <coughs> we can finance a number of U.S. projects here, um, <coughs> to the extent that U.S. equipment's used, U.S. infrastructure's used to do so. Let me just grab some water. Because from. Whatever impression I have, the U.S. has not done very well in <coughs> infrastructure sector in India. Well, most, I mean, when it comes to roads, there's not a lot that's really imported to build a road. So that is largely local. So whether it's in India, I was last week, two weeks ago in Colombia, which has a giant road building project. There's not a lot that outside, and there may be outside investors, but in terms of equipment, except for some basic earth moving goods, there's not a lot of imports that are needed to really put a road structure into place, though it's certainly critical. 
Uh, rail, we've been active, uh, though GE did a large project. They did not need our financing. And we're probably different from other export banks is we actually would prefer the private sector to do the financing. And I think that uh, interest rates have come down in India. Uh, tenor is longer. So in some ways, and renewable and so forth, there's been a lot of local funding, uh, which is not needed as much of export finance funding as in the past. However, with uh, the Prime Minister's ambitious and, uh, frankly, admirable plan of 175 gigawatts of renewable power by 2022, uh, my hunch would be that it's going to, India will need to attract as much capital to fulfill that uh, ambitious and much bigger plan. Rana, you have, are you financing large infrastructure projects? Do you have money stuck anywhere? I know I am leaving Sunil for last because he's the one who gets people out when they, when they get stuck. <coughs> but Shekhar, uh, I must confess, and you rightly and the Honorable Minister pointed this out, <coughs> that the biggest opportunity actually, if you see, is in adversity. India's uh, infrastructure sector, which was painted like red, now has become green. I am very deeply convinced that infrastructure with the right leadership in place is creating the augmentation, it is creating the de-risking, it is creating the debulking, and in a way making sure the banking system and the financial institutions, Indian and some overseas as well, have a soft landing. And I think the minister elucidated that very, very well, that uh, the opportunity in itself in the future is going to make a very significant difference. And I will take my uh, little time here to highlight to the benefit <coughs> of the panel and this uh, you know, team here who's here. Number one, if you see India's uh, urban infrastructure, I start with that, is uh, probably the biggest opportunity in the world. You know why? Today we have approximately 31, 32% of our people living in urban and metro centers. This will potentially gravitate to minimum 40% before 2030 or sooner. What does that mean? What is urban infrastructure? Urban infrastructure is smart infrastructure. Hotels, hospitals, educational platforms, building affordable housing, and creating a ecosystem which today we define as smart cities. To me, this is the single biggest opportunity uh, in India. Number two, when you look at transportation and logistics, the Honorable Minister's uh, you know, portfolio, which is a very comprehensive and very in-depth portfolio. When you look at the surrounding system around this portfolio, and I will give you some data points. 64,000 kilometers uh, is uh, the minister's objective. 55,000 crores, which is approximately $9 billion of investment in the current budget. Today, 90% of India's passenger traffic is on roads. And approximately, sir, correct me, 60 to 65% of the freight is going on roads. It's the biggest opportunity in the world. Now, you dovetail that with the 7,500 kilometers, and I do not wish to be you know, very general, but the ports, the maritime, and the minister very uh, you know, intelligently articulated the seven rivers opportunity. I call it the seven rivers, because India has seven majestic rivers. And the seven rivers opportunity in terms of maritime, in terms of transportation, low cost, sustainable, clean energy, those are opportunities that our Honorable Minister is highlighting. And if I move on to the railways, railways, sir, uh, Shekharji, and the Honorable Minister and the panel, was mothballed in India for 20 years. For 20 years, it has been mothballed. Not one inch has moved. In fact, we've gone probably backwards, not forward. <laughs> And all of a sudden, after some uh, you know, new, let's say, positive energy has been invoked, the railways is becoming almost like a $100 billion opportunity over the next you know, at least 10 years or sooner, much sooner in my assessment. I can add to that because airports, there are uh, 120 
defunct airports in the country. If they're energized in 12 to 18 months, they get the movement going, low cost, you know, aviation. And if we build, in my opinion, tier two and tier three airports in India, it is uh, by far the most colossal opportunity in the whole world and what it means in terms of uh, growth. Every 1% investment uh, incrementally in, uh, in our 1% investment in infrastructure as a percentage of GDP, and please, ladies and gentlemen, our GDP is only two trillion, right? So if we invest 1%, it creates 3.4 million jobs in India. In America, it creates 1.5 million jobs. In Brazil, it creates 1.3 million jobs. So I think uh, infrastructure as a catalyst, as the Honorable uh, Minister has pointed out, is probably the biggest economic growth job multiplier. And naturally, we have to reduce the economic cost of funds by creating an Indian monetary policy, of which I'm a very strong advocate. So, so <coughs> So, Neil, how do you create that Indian monetary fund? So, you start lending without charging any interest. <laughs> and second, tell us also your experience of stressed assets. Because, you know, you have the MRI scans of every stressed asset in India. Right. Yeah. Fortunately, unfortunately, uh, in my career in the last 28 years since we started, we have been just involved in infrastructure right from 89, 90. And I've seen this journey. I think India started his journey on infrastructure in a focused way in 96, 97 with the National Highway Program uh, with uh, Atal Baj uh, Bihari Bajpayee had driven. I was very closely associated at that time because I was a member of the planning commission in the infra space. And we saw the change which uh, happened. I think in this last 20 years, India, the amount of PPP India has done, I think globally no other country has ever done that. So when you do something, then only you will make mistakes. So why did PPPs fail? So I'll tell you. So therefore, what happened was, uh, when you really look at what is PPP, is a public-private partnership. When you talk about a partnership, you have to get the strengths of both the partners. Uh, the private sector brings in expertise, uh, skills, a certain capability, etc. The public sector, which is the government. And, and capital. Capital, no. That's no. where my question is. Uh, my, and that's where I think a lot of models, which now it is getting evolved, as uh, uh, Gatkariji also said, our Honorable Minister, in terms of the hybrid model, etc., that you need to, when you cre create a, uh, a PPP model, you need to look at the strength of each partner, how people come together. We create a lot of uh, partnerships and businesses and all. You always look at the strength of each partner, and then you bring in. The strength of the government is capital. The, uh, no one can borrow as cheap as the government. Therefore, by bringing in capital on a longer term at a higher cost is in infra is criminal because you're loading the system, loading the economy. And that's what had happened in, uh, I would say, more so in the late 90s till about 2011, 12, where there was a huge pressure that PPP will work. Everyone jumped into it. Capital came in. Huge interest costs of 12, 14, 15, 16 percent also people borrowed and was building up the infra. It, is, it was not sustainable because you, do not, you did not have long-term capital uh, virtually available in the country. Uh, the banking system started to get choked. And then when a crisis happened, and the crisis happened due to poor governance in 2010-11, when uh, we had various scams and uh, various Supreme Court uh, pronouncements, uh, uh, governance went for a song because of uh, delay in uh, projects of clearances of uh, environment and uh, land issues. So that shock shook the entire system. And that has been, I would say, the greatest learning also. If you look back now, uh, the amount of learning which India has had, no other country has. I think India can teach the world how infrastructure to be built and how it can be developed. My sense is that at this juncture where we stand today with the government committed to bring in the reforms and the change, uh, there are two kinds of opportunities. One, the opportunities for investors are in the brownfield assets. Uh, there's been a lot of asset which has been created or partly created, partly stuck. Uh, with the way the government has worked out to clear up a lot of these projects and the problems which are there, many of the investments can come into that to revive it, complete it, you have much lesser risk. Because in the infra, mind you, there are two 
kinds of risk. One is a risk during construction, and one is post-construction. The construction risk in India is very, very high. And in the last seven, eight years, it has increased a lot more. <coughs> Having been in that space for the last 28 years, virtually financed every contractor in the country uh, uh, and infra project, we have seen that challenges. People went in uh, for short term. So I think that is where there's one opportunity where investors can look at brownfield assets where the construction risk has been virtually minimized or has almost gone. And that's where I think uh, India today stands with a great position because globally there is a huge capital sitting there with virtually most countries having negative interest or very low interest rates. And if we can get our act together, which is happening now, we can very well attract that capital into that. We need to correct our financial system. Today, the challenge in the last few years, which we have not been able to, that how do you unlock the banking system to be able to take decisions, uh, cut loss, and move forward? And that's where the process has got stuck and has been a little slow in the journey. I'm sure with the efforts of all, uh, it will start to get uh, unlocked. The second area, I believe, uh, where the infra opportunity would be there in the green field, I would say would be a little different. Uh, there, the private sector's focus during construction period should be to develop and build the infra. The financing part, hand-holding, has to be done by the government for the next some time. Once the asset is created, uh, the government, as a partner, would be the, in the best position to then attract investors globally into an asset class which will be long-term, which is required for pensioners to get their uh, returns, and which will be safer. So, uh, Nitinji, uh, <coughs> you agree with the idea of changing the concept of PPP in such a way that capital is actually brought by the government? The ground reality, what he says, is absolutely correct. Because of last uh, five, six years, the Indian investors and contractors, they are facing a lot of problems. But they also... So I'm giving you the solution. As a government, no, we don't have any problem for investment. You are all welcome. But I am telling you about my financial... We don't have constraints. <laughs> Even we construct in Mumbai, uh, the bank, Mumbai Baroda Express Highway of 42,000 crores, we have decided to make it in EPC mode. Today, up till now, we have signed the contracts more than 3,50,000 crores. The NHI's toll income is more than 10,000 crores with the AAA rating. The government has already given me the permission to raise 70,000 crores from the market. Already LIC, the pension fund is with me. Now my problem is, this is the time for India, what you said is absolutely correct, that our majority invest in the road sector, their position is not good. And I really admit that it is not because of their mistakes. The 80% mistakes from the government side. Land acquisition problem, forest environment clearance problem, utility shifting, litigations. Now we have taken a decision that without 80% of land acquisition, we will not give appointment date. So today, whatever the new project we are giving work order, where 80% of land acquisition is the response of the government. After that, we are in appointment date. Our response to take the environmental and forest clearance. And now that is the reason still we are also the, uh, for this uh, hybrid annuity is only because of the situation. Because in PPP, people don't have that much uh, investment capacity. And even today, in my department, my with own financial strength, there will be no problem for me to give more construction of more than 3 lakhs crore to 5 lakh crores, even in EPC mode. By which I am going to strengthen the Indian investor, Indian contractors. And after that, they will be in position because banks are not also in good position. And I am also telling you one thing. At a time when I taken charge as a minister, uh, Mr. Rana, at least his bank, people coming to my office 10 times. For every project, with every banker, either in any bank in India, there was a meeting at night, 12 o'clock. And every time we discuss the issue, government has taken 21 cabinet decisions. And out of 403 projects, where the investment involved 3,85,000 crores, out of which 95% problem already we have solved. Just so, a difficult task like Delhi, Jaipur. It's a, such a problematic project. And now we are in position that we don't have stole project. So would it ba be fair to say that under your leadership, 
that I and my team made sure that at least 90% of the projects, not only Yes Bank but other projects, came back on the track. Yes, yes. That was that's exactly I want to give the uh, create to confidence. At this point, team. please, uh, we can go on uh, till 6.30. Uh, even uh, uh, Shekhar ji, I am in every forum, I ask the people a question. Can you tell me the name of the project? Where is the problem is there? And suppose, because because of <coughs> four or five years CXR problems, there is a concept, uh, perception in the mind of the people that there are a lot of problems, no project are facing problems. But after a two and a half year, the situation is changed. And everywhere, in Delhi, Dehradun project, in Delhi, Jaipur project, Delhi, Ludhiana project, all are moving fast. So my, my, my request to all of you, presently, what are the problem, previously problem, our government has taken 21 decisions by which we have already improved the situation and 95% of problem already we have solved. So now that this is not a situation, it can be a positive situation for you to invest in it. Please, feel, please raise your hands and ask questions. <coughs> Just introduce yourself and uh, ask a question as briefly as possible. Yeah, uh, my question is for the Honorable Minister. It's always so... Uh, pleasuresome to hear you. You're on top of all the numbers. It gives us the confidence that things work out. Uh, your account on the highway projects, enhancement of the total kilometers, enhancement or de-bottlenecking sounds great. But what about within the city roads? The quality is so poor. I know it doesn't come under your ministry directly. <laughs> uh, you can take the shelter there. But you know, uh, Minister, I'll give you one small illustration. People from Gurgaon, if they have a meeting in the morning in Delhi, they check into the hotel previous day. So he, know, he's it's, absolutely it's, correct. But in I'm Bangalore, telling you, yeah. just front of this hotel, the road is here. It is not with me. But <laughs> I have to face the problem every day. <laughs> I'm coming from Nagpur, and after airport, it takes one hour, 20 minutes for me to come to, from Nagpur to Delhi. And from Delhi airport to my house, take it one and a half hour, somewhere two hours. So, without, I already decided to make it road, national highway from that uh, the, uh, 13 Murti lane, declare it. And now I am making all this road winding. I am taking the land from the defense ministry also. And also up to Gudwa. We have already started the four flyovers there. You, come to Mumbai <laughs> no, you know, you people forget that he built India's first private road. Public private partnership road. No, no. The, the Mum uh, Mumbai Pune Express. You and I construct 55 flyovers, Varli Bandra sailing project, and Mumbai Pune Express. Uh, so all without. In fact, he, he, the he founded the idea of privately funded uh, infrastructure. Uh, question there. Uh, my question is also for uh, the minister. I've had the privilege of working uh, for him when he was the PWD minister in Maharashtra. So, my question is at that point, you were dealing with a certain scale of problems and a certain scale of city, in fact, 17 flyovers in Bombay, as well as in the state. What have you found that is similar at the national level and what has been different? What have you had to do differently at the scale? In all metro cities, we are facing serious problem as per the transport is concerned. Bangalore is the worst. Aziz Premji and Kiran Bajumdar come to me everywhere. But my problem is my mandate is only for national highway. So only if you want to improve Bangalore, we need 60,000 crores. If even Mumbai's coastal road, it needs something 40,000 crores. And is a somewhere we are requesting to a planning commission and the PMO that we have to look because these are the serious problem. And somewhere you have to think about it. Everyone want to start his industry in Mumbai. Everyone want to go in Bangalore. Everyone want to go in Chennai. How this can be? How, how we can solve this problem? Somewhere we need decentralization of the industries, decentralization of development. And other sites are also equally good. And even one, of the best things, <laughs> one of the best things happen, happening in India right now is that a whole new capital city is being constructed. Amravati in yes. Andhra. It will be the first city India will build after Chandigarh in the 50s. Yes. Full city. It's not just a capital. Uh, Gaurav Gogoi, a young member of parliament from the most infrastructure starved region of India. Well, Shekhar, it is without a doubt that uh, Honorable Minister enjoys a popularity which is across political parties. And representing the state of Northeast, uh, representing the region of Northeast, connectivity is very important for its economic growth. 
how what is the ministry's view of connecting uh, rest of india with northeast via bangladesh through the old road rail and waterways route because it would reduce logistic costs and of course bring people closer together already we have signed the agreement between the bnn bangladesh nepal and bharat and bhutan so the adb is already ready to finance more than 30000 crores for that project my most problem is uh, regarding northeast we have already form a uh, nhidcl a special organization for northeast and hill area we have already given the mandate of constructing the road construction more than 1 lakh crores and today already we have signed the contracts more than 40000 crores but unfortunately i am telling you about assam i am i am i am very much unhappy about assam the land acquisition problem somewhere the forest problem we need the cooperation from the state government also and our projects are facing the problem but re related with bangladesh what my suggestion is in sagarmala we have a meeting with the minister of bangladesh our 95% of trade with bangladesh is on the road so our idea is now by this waterways sahib ganj will be the multimodal hub and we will take material from sahib ganj to chitgaon and by chitgaon it will go to northeast it can save the cost so that highway from agartala to chitgaon yes yes and even bangladesh is ready for the bangladesh is having we have got a very good cooperation from bangladesh we have signed all the uh, agreement related with brahmaputra already i am not exactly but there are some 15 to 16 places in the there we have started bus service to bangladesh and uh, even we are going up to the myanmar and even uh, in nepal side in bihar and uttar pradesh we are constructing the roads the situation was not very bad at that time but we are giving priority for that but my request is which i need cooperation from the your organization ci yeah, that we want to organize a conference in dhaka and kolkata with a cooperation of bangladesh and the minister has already promised me we will bangladesh government and indian government will work and we want to divert diversify this 95% traffic on the road to the waterways it can be a cost effective pollution free and it can be very useful it will increase the trade between the two countries and already bangladesh is ready for that today also we have taken the maruti car from varanasi to northeast and assam it's going on uh, four days before i was in cochin a very really a good project starts they have taken some uh, 3000 cars from chennai and coming to cochin after it to kanla and uh, at the same time the nano has given them 400 cars they taking with it and now they taking it to chennai and now mahindra and honda is also interested to transport their car even fertilizer steel uh, it can be a really Actually, logistic point to very it's true in india we have never used our own coastline for uh, yes uh, nick uh, all the stuff that india is doing now or india has been doing for the past few years you think it now impresses global investors or you think they still have concerns Yes, I think so. Um, and going back to an earlier point, um, the scale of PPPs done in India is is truly impressive. And we talked about learning as well. And I agree, it's a two-way learning process. The rest of the world can learn from what India has done, as well as, of course, India learning from best practice around the world. And also, India has much to teach neighbouring markets like Bangladesh. central asia the middle east africa um and asia um i facilitated a workshop um first thing this morning on accelerating india's uh, infrastructure and the the discussion was very good and wide ranging over a couple of hours but broadly the conclusions were and i summarized them as two abc's and we've touched on some of these points already um ambition building trust and um Uh, uh capacity at the visionary at the uh, strategic level i think uh, in terms of vision india does this um as well as any country in the world it's a master at investment promotion um projects like make in india have a global profile um these days but i would um urge you all to continue to um uh, publicize your pipelines and your your plans 
because there are a lot of decision makers sat in investors around the world who maybe only come to India once a year and maybe don't leave an environment like this. So I would use every opportunity to continue promoting what you're trying to um, do here. And I don't know if someone in this room is already thinking about the potential of virtual reality, but I wouldn't be surprised if the first national infrastructure plan I see on a virtual reality headset might be one from India. Um, the theme of building trust was also uh, a recurring theme um, throughout the, uh, the day, asking um, the public sector to put itself in the shoes of private investors um, to understand the uh, commercial perspective. Um, and then on um, capabilities, uh, the need to build skills, and there was strong support for the idea of a central agency. Then at the more mundane project level, there was a uh, debate around the allocation, um, the allocation of risks, um, bankability, um, and continuity of policy. Thank you. Uh, Rana, uh, before you, Sunil, uh, after you, Sunil talked about defreezing the banks because banks are frozen. You think that situation is beginning to thaw or not yet? And if not, what can be done? I think there are uh, more than two compartments. There's a compartment which is going through compression and uh, maybe some introspection in India, which is uh, the public sector banking system. But uh, nevertheless, I must confess, with the very proactive leadership, it's getting out of inertia. I think the wheels are moving all over again. I must say that with the proactive efforts of the government, that the wheels of the public sector banks, which were stuck for about the last two years, are beginning to move. They are in first gear. Uh, if I have to put some you know, illustration to that. At the same time, please remember the private banking sector in India, which is also part of the Indian banking sector, is uh, reasonably okay. So the fundamental point is that uh, today, if we have to finance uh, new projects, there's uh, fundamental debt capital available, locally available. There is uh, capital available internationally well, India is just about 0.8% of the global investments in infrastructure. 0.8%, right? And it's a 1.5, and it's, I think the subject of this discussion is a 1.5 trillion market by 2030. And it's giving returns, pension fund returns, is giving returns on provident funds, insurance funds, which are going to be far in excess, even currency adjusted of 7 to 8 percent in the world, when the rest of the world is going through negative returns. I think we need to evangelize this cause. We need to promote this cause. We need to bring in investments multiple into our country. The banking system, Shekhar, on its own, on standalone basis, is not enough. And which is why the presence of uh, Fred from the Exim Bank uh, the presence of KPMG infrastructure global leader becomes very important because India's today infrastructure opportunity and its resultant benefits and most of all returns to international investors is potentially the most attractive market in the whole world. Indian banks will keep the momentum going, right? But we alone cannot handle it, right? That's the fundamental point. I think Nick wants to come in very briefly. Just to make one, one quick well. point to, to agree with you, there is more than $100 trillion of assets in institutional investors around the world, 65% of whom are looking to increase their allocation in, in infrastructure, and most of whom say to me, our problem is finding bankable deals around the world. And everything that's being done in this country like people like the minister, is absolutely correct to fix the problems of the past and make projects more bankable. So I agree with you. There is a wall of money out there um, waiting to find bankable projects in this country. But sir, if you just allow me just one more minute. If you see fundamentally India needs, uh, because we've got a lot of capital locked in. But that doesn't mean all the projects are like, you know, good, bad and ugly. So there are good projects also. If we unlock them through takeout finance, if we unleash those projects through post-completion investment trusts, real estate trusts, 
and I think the regulation is becoming more and more enabling. We will create a lot more capital capacity in our economy. Second point related to that. Ram, I think there's a question, if you don't mind. No, no, I'd love to answer any question. But sir, it's an important point kya hai, to uh, be fundamentally right that this opportunity is the single biggest in the world. And right now, the entire, you know, let's say the stars, all the infrastructure stars in India have come together. And therefore, to me, building the, you know, economic model, unleashing the capital which is locked in, which is possible through takeout finance, through bonds, as we have done green bonds, as we are doing municipal bonds, we want to do affordable housing bonds. So there are ample opportunities. Question here and then question in the back after that. Okay, so we have talked about the machine, uh, different kind of vehicles and the roads. I've just tried to add a human element to it. We may have roads and we may have vehicles, but one of the serious challenges India is facing is, is in terms of truck drivers, because uh, I work with the truck drivers and... If when you I, would introduce yourself. Yeah, okay, I'm Vishal and I work for a tech startup in logistics space. Uh, so one of the things that we face the problem is that when we go to hire truck drivers, people are ready to do maybe a 5,000 rupees job and work at a computer, but in trucking, even if you pay them 25,000 rupees, 30,000 rupees, there are like, people are just not ready to take this job. And it's, it's a statistic that India needs a million drivers every year. And we are just sometimes worried that from where they are going to come, who are going to be these people who will drive on these roads? So my question to the panel and maybe to the minister is how we can, there are a lot of innovation that is happening in this space where we are doing a driver relay model through which trucking is a day job now. Uh, there is truck, truck aggregation, all, all those things are happening, but how we can work with the government to make trucking sexy again, where people people like take this job as a matter of pride. We have already shortage of 22% of drivers. So our idea is we are opening now the driving training centers, those who are authorized to give fitness certificate and pollution certificate. And the company like Mahindra, Tata, Ashok Leyland, already we have opened 22 centers where computer is taking the exam, the driving test and declare pass and fail. And giving it this explanation to the, minister, to the transport ministry by satellite. And after that, within three days, it is mandatory for the officer to give him the license. But presently, you are absolutely correct. We have shortage of 22%. And our plan is in next two and a half year, we will at least want to open more than 3,000 driving training centers, not in the city, urban area, big Delhi, Mumbai. It is in the rural sector, tribal sector, our plan is to open. And I will request you to the automobile manufacturer, I already, lot of centers are open by them. But the companies are ready to open these driving training centers, fitness certificate and other thing. Uh, we are open and we will give them opportunity for that. And you, what your problem is, a genuine problem. And after two and a half year, somewhere within four or five years, it will be solved. There will be surplus drivers. Question there. So my name is uh, Pratik Agarwal. I'm from, I run the infrastructure business at Vedanta Group. Uh, there's no doubt that the core investment in, PP, uh, in infrastructure in India through PPP has done a fantastic job, barring a few projects. But so what about basic utilities of water, broadband, and gas uh, and electricity, which continues to be completely in government hands except for a few cases. And of course, this is a state subject, possibly not a central subject. But can there be competition in those sectors where people compete to provide water to each of us and then maybe we'll get good quality in, in that space? And it's for anyone uh, in the it's panel. It's not with my, my department. I'm telling you because I'm from Nagpur. I'm the first person in India we are selling our municipal sewage water to government of Maharashtra, getting 18 crore rupees royalty. After this experience with Uma Bharti ji and Dharmendra Pradhan, we have started one project in Mathura. By taking 20 MLD of sewage water of Mathura, making recycling of it and giving it to the Indian oil refinery in Mathura. Now we have 70 projects. And I am telling you, this is also the one of the important sectors. We, we can create the economy of 10 lakh crores in this liquid waste and solid waste. We have taken a decision, this Ghazipur is a big fountain of this all garbage of Delhi. We have taken a decision to segregate that garbage and now we have decided to use in it a Delhi Merit Express Highway. So the conversion of waste into wealth 
it can be a good thing for <laughs> CIA and it's I am confident that this can be economy of 10 lakh crores and on PP basis PPP basis it is uh, it is viable at the same time even government approaches for the gas and power everywhere <coughs> approaches to create a private care to give opportunity to the private people for investment in this project Fred would any of this invest uh, interest you and your investors? Well, uh, w again, we at Exim Bank don't really work with investors. We're going to work with yes. companies here that are going to be purchasing those tools. One thing I would say earlier, um, but having a balanced plan, because uh, to the extent that the rail system gets built up, it takes pressure off the road system. I was just recently in Egypt, uh, where it's much more extreme. 99% of the freight travels on highways in Egypt, so they're much more clogged even than here. But they also recognize by investing in rail, they will actually relieve the congestion on the roads, and waterways are another point. So having that balance, and the you know what I admire about the, the government is even laying out the infrastructure plan on uh, renewable power attracts investors and attracts people when they see a very clear plan. I've been in many countries uh, in my time as chairman of the Exim Bank, and those com countries that have good rule of law, uh, a clear contracting path, and clear plans will attract the best products and the best uh, infrastructure firms globally. But when it's somewhat muddled or people don't think it's a level playing field, is actually going to discourage that from coming here. Question there? Yeah. So we've talked about the uh, If you would <coughs> introduce yourself. So I'm Monica. I run a construction company called GPB Intra Projects. So we've talked about the huddles here. Uh, I guess the major huddle which I face is the sexism in the field. I'm not surprised to see all the women, uh, all the men sitting out. It's a manal. <laughs> it's a manal. So it's, it's not a panel, it's manal, I would say. Of yes. course, I'd agree to you. So how about uh, taking on sexism in the field? We're talking about problems that Infra is facing. I guess the biggest problem that I am facing being running an Infra company is the sexism in the field. We Could don't have. On this? Sure. <laughs> yes, sir. But uh, is your uh, question complete? Um, you may answer, sir. But uh, as the manual uh, or panel, right? Uh, I'm very proud as a father of three daughters that uh, today's uh, new age infrastructure that my three daughters and uh, all reasonably educated uh, are building a new age infrastructure, uh, building an innovation district in Mumbai, in Mahalakshmi Innovation District. Uh, it's been, actually it's called the Lower Parel Innovation District. I think the opportunity for women entrepreneurship in India, and I speak as a, as a father of three daughters, not, not only as Yes Bank boss, you know, but I promise you that it is by far the most attractive opportunity to invest. And today the support system, the mechanisms by the government, international support, private entrepreneurship, as in like private equity support, venture capital support. And I would like to believe somewhat, not subsidize, even uh, capital market support is, uh, is like tremendous. And I think uh, it should not be any complex. It should be today a very positive energy factor. Do you still have the microphone? No. Uh, what exactly do you mean by sexism in infrastructure? go or probably in the offices and the, to the clients that I go oh ma'am oh she's a civil she's a female civil engineer dude I can be a civil engineer only <laughs> why do I need to have my gender so at least I'm not an uncivil engineer <laughs> 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 why do my gender has to be emphasized when talked about my degree so that's the entire thing I want to bring upon here as well that it's uh, I think you got somebody interested and I think we'll have to take one more question somebody's been uh, I hear I, you. I think we'll have time if, only if, for it, one if it gives you any measure of support, my mother was the first woman civil engineer in the country. Ran a construction company for 35 years. And at one point, I think, commanded about 1,500 men. So I, I think the industry is, the industry is okay. I, I, I hear you on statistics and numbers, though. Uh, Shekhar, I'll just add one area which uh, will be important for potential investors and all. The change which has happened in India in the last uh, recent time which is going to have a cascading effect is two. One, when you have a PPP, there would be disputes. 
the key is how do you create a mechanism to address those for fast dispute resolution dispute resolution more particularly in infra it is very and that a lot of work has happened i must compliment the government and the honorable minister on that and that is a major when i go globally people say that you get into contract for 25 30 40 years of concession you will have challenges and you don't know you can't visualize what will happen in 15 or 20 25 years but there must be a mechanism to address that and that i think is now getting set in place uh, through arbitration to dispute l- resolution and i think that's a can be a great comfort for for potential investors and the second is the bankruptcy code which has been uh, law which has been now passed we hope that in the next couple of months the implementation would happen these are things when you create a mechanism in the environment in the economy which gives confidence to investor that okay if there's a problem there is a methodology uh, there which can solve it i just thought of sharing but i think uh, shankar uh, one uh, point uh, the three p's so, now uh, that uh, the we might not might not have time for more than one question but please do and then you can uh, i'll uh, three p's have become four p's now sir yeah hi uh, i'm raghu ram uh, from the indian institute of management ahmedabad um well i had a couple of comments actually one is i think i'm really happy to see that uh, the you know the way the different ppp projects the problems have been unlocked but really the future i think in road projects now seems to be that we should the the construction risk is it's just too vulnerable for private parties and therefore i think the epc route uh, and that's what seems to be happening uh, and i think that's a good step forward the um, you asked uh, the minister asked about are there problem projects i mean one project i've been studying in the past few years is the kishangarh udaipur uh, ahmedabad six laning project which of course got caught into a lot of knots uh, i hope we will But, uh, see today the all uh, the project first was taken by one company now the matter was sub judies i just call them we make the compromise problem is solved we divided project into four or five parts packages and already the three packages in a position that we are going to giving the work order for that probably today i discuss with the this issue with my project director within 2 3 days we are also going to finalize the udaipur to some city that package of some uh, 1500 crore or 2000 crore it's in now sure. no problem uh, just another point on uh, safety you started with that and uh, i really think there's a lot that we can do irrespective of the safety bill having you know got stuck if even in national highways which i guess have a larger share of accidents just because of the traffic improving road engineering um better shoulders the median cuts uh, the signages i think you know, we are running out of time so maybe you can talk yeah, a bit later so i think that but i think the minister has been working on some of that uh, road safety and better signages actually uh, for major accidents in government there is a practice that driver is responsible for the accident <laughs> right first of all the the dpr defective dpr and the road engineering is responsible for maximum accidents i am accepting as our fault and unfortunately in a public press conference i accept that after taking charge as a minister there are a lot of good things but unfortunately the accident increased by 4% and it is only because there are maximum problem because of road engineering so now we have taken a decision we identify 786 black spots uh, we are spending 11000 crores on it and at the same time we have making 100% uh, cr fund to the state government for that and uh, we are making traffic signal system uh, crash barriers uh, signals uh, the marking system of internet standard uh, just one month before i was in usa we are just taking adopting all of your rules regulation related with that and within 2 years we will have a, we will think about it and we will show the and life of the people a final point like uh, other <laughs> ministries compare states why don't we have an inter rto uh, you know ranking I, because rtos I, I think, are really no, no, i, I think in fact he has yeah. an answer and i uh, after that i have to close it uh, but since you are a professor uh, we got an extra minute you have a point of view on indian rtos <laughs> road so transport what officers say, what professor saab is suggesting is not possible because the rto and the road safety act is a concurrent list and i am i am facing lot of problems now he used a particular adjective for all rtos Actually, in india bolie appointed a committee on the chairmanship of yunus khan 
an 18 minister from all political party now they have recommended now parliament have joint selection committee they are arranged meeting with the joint selection committee and the ministerial committee now at uh, 27 something they were meeting was finalized now next parliament session probably i am confident that we will be in position the past in fact he described road transport officers as decoits once <laughs> <laughs> he got himself into trouble <laughs> So I think we have to close it on, on that note. Uh, it, you know, the sign of a successful session is which overshoots its time, particularly when it's the last session of the day when everybody wants to go home. So thank you very much. Thank Great you. panel and even better audience.